So I think as a whole, these changes sort of go in the right direction and could have some positive effects, especially if they're improved during the trilogue stage. But my fear is that as currently worded and depending on they are interpreted, they have some issues, right? The documentation obligations will prove either difficult to comply or ineffectual. And the safeguards obligation might require development of content ID like tools and even lead to over filtering. Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Joao Pedro Quintais. Joao is assistant professor at the University of Amsterdam's Law School in the Institute for Information Law, better known as IVIR. Joao notably studies how intellectual property law applies to new technologies and the implications of copyright law and its enforcement by algorithms on the rights and freedoms of internet users, on the remuneration of creators, and on technological development. Joao is also co-managing editor of the widely read Kluwer Copyright blog and has published extensively in the area of information law. So, Joao, I really enjoyed reading your article on Generative AI, Copyright and the AI Act, where you look at the latest developments of the EU AI Act and suggest improvements when it comes to the last minute reference to copyright that was added by the European Parliament. So could you outline in less than five minutes what your key findings were? Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So I think perhaps it is important to start by where we were before these last minute additions on the EU copyright law side of things, and then we'll see what the AI Act brings. So on the copyright side at EU level, we have since 2019, this directive on copyright in the digital single market, which after a number of years has been implemented in all or almost all member states. The directive contains a broad definition of text and data mining or TDM that would, in my view, apply to most activities involved in the development of large language models, including web scraping or harvesting and the training of data sets. The directive then sets out two mandatory exceptions for TDM, meaning that member states will have to implement them into national laws. And this is sort of different from the previous exceptions in new copyright law which for the most part were optional for member states and therefore did not really lead to significant harmonization. We can get into the specifics about these later on. But importantly, these exceptions for TDM were proposed and approved before the boom of generative AI models and their generative general availability to individual users online. So for a good part of its legislative process, the same is actually true for the AI Act. So as I noted in the blog that you mentioned, with the rapid development and availability of Gen AI models, authors and copyright holders became concerned that these tools are actually built on unauthorized and unremunerated use of their works, while at the same time having a negative impact on their livelihood. And in fact, there are current, currently a number of lawsuits, mostly outside the EU, in the US and UK, but also one in Germany, on the potential copyright infringement by generative AI tools. Now, so from my perspective, the biggest copyright law question in the EU and in the US actually is currently is whether using these in copyright works to train generative AI models is copyright infringement or is covered by an exception in Europe, the TDM exceptions mostly, and in the US, the fair use doctrine. Now, in Europe, these concerns made their way to the parliamentary discussions of the AI Act, which is a regulation, not a directive, and which is separate from copyright, and eventually to the compromise text adopted by the parliament. And it's this test text that's going to make its way to the trilogue to be negotiated with the Council and the Commission. Now, what's interesting in this version is that it actually directly mentions copyright. And although it exists separately and autonomously from the EU copyright rules, it does seem to try to exist in a sort of relation of complementarity with them. Now, what do I mean by this? The proposal defines generative AI models as types of foundation models, and it clearly applies to ChatGPT stable diffusion, mid-journey, and the like, and it then attaches a number of specific obligations to them. So first, they must comply with a number of transparency obligations that are outlined elsewhere in the AI Act, and those relate to human AI interaction, so not super interesting for us. Second, when training, designing, or developing these models, providers must ensure adequate safeguards against the generation of content that would be in breach of union law, and then there's a bunch of other language. We'll get probably to that later on, but this would also apply to copyright infringing content. And in my view, as I see it, 
it would likely require some sort of filtering measures at the output level. Third, generative AI providers have to document and make publicly available a sufficiently detailed summary of the use of training data protected under copyright law. So this is an obligation that's aimed at the input or training stage of generative AI models and would in theory help copyright holders to control use of their works as input to these models. So I think as a whole, these changes sort of go in the right direction and could have some positive effects, especially if they're improved during the trilog stage. But my fear is that as currently worded and depending on they are interpreted, they have some issues, right? The documentation obligations will prove either difficult to comply or ineffectual. And the safeguards obligation might require development of content ID like tools and even lead to over filtering. You mentioned the fact that there's transparency obligations uh, in, in the AI Act. And in, in the article that I mentioned, you say that um, it's going to be impossible or extremely difficult to comply with the transparency obligation to document and make publicly available a summary of the use of training data protected under copyright law. So the input part, as, as you mentioned, and that the devil uh, is in the details. C can you explain how that devil should look like to make it feasible? Well, so my point here really depends on how we interpret this obligation, right? On the one hand, if all that you are requiring from these providers is that they document in a general sense or general manner and make publicly available a summary of the use of training data protected under copyright law, then I don't think this is very useful. So it's not clear what this summary would entail and how it could help copyright holders to have a better understanding of how their materials are used for training purposes. For instance, with a view to check whether the text and data mining question complies with legal requirements and to reserve their rights under, as I'm sure we'll discuss Article 4 of the directive, eventually leading to possibilities to generate licensing revenue. Having said that, it is arguable that some level of transparency, for instance, at the level of what websites were scraped, and uh, that could help rights holders to ascertain whether such activity complies with the requirement that TDM is made from a lawfully accessible source and other materials. Now, whether this is sufficient or satisfactory is doubtful. Now, on the other hand, and what I mentioned also in the article is that if the obligation to document as the goal of generative AI providers listing all or most of the copyright material that they are including in their training data sets in an itemized manner with clear indication of rights ownership claims and things like that, then I think it's impossible to comply with it, right? The low threshold of originality, the territorial fragmentation of copyright and its ownership, absence of a registration requirement for works, and in general, the poor state of rights ownership metadata kind of demonstrate this impossibility. So in the article, my suggestion is that legislators clarify the meaning and the scope of this obligation. And one approach I see would be to reconsider the provision in, in, in light of what's its policy aim which in my mind at least appears to include a desire to help rights holders and artists and individual creators to exercise and possibly exploit commercially their rights over materials that are used during the training stage. If that is the case, then I think the provision should rather focus more on improving access to data sets, incentivizing cooperation between providers and rights holders, and possibly standardization of the reservation of rights or opt-outs which rights holders are entitled to under the directive. So, so you, you actually mentioned um, two things I wanted to talk about, which is, on the one hand, the text and data mining provisions in, in the Copyright and the Digital Single Market Directive. Um, there's, there's an Article 3 that is, uh, applies to TDM for scientific research purposes. Not really going to talk about that one in, in the context of Gen AI. But then there's Article 4, which covers commercial users and which has an opt-out uh, for rights holders who do not wish to have their works mined. So can you explain how you connect this um, opt-out and, and this text and data mining for commercial users, how you connect it with the AI Act and what your views are on the different schools of thought that you mention uh, in your blog post uh, with, for example, Cory Doctorow, um, the, the science fiction writer and activist, who recently co-authored Choke Point Capitalism and has warned about the risk of a market concentration and the exploitation of creators if um, AI is not dealt with in an appropriate way. 
Uh, indeed, uh, as I mentioned, the directive contains these two TDM exceptions in Articles 3 and 4. Less important, as you also mentioned, Article 3 provides an exception for acts of TDM for the purposes of scientific research by research organizations and cultural heritage institutions and regarding works that they have lawful access to and a number of additional conditions. More importantly for our purposes is Article 4 that sets forth an exception for reproductions and extractions of lawfully accessed works and subject matter for the purposes of TDM. So this is different from Article 3, which is limited to scientific research purposes by certain entities. Now, this is the way it's generally accepted in the within the legal community of com commentators, at least, is that if you carry out TDM activities under Article 4, such activities may be for commercial purposes or in the commercial context. So I think this would be the exception that would likely cover, if at all, the training activities for the development of generative AI tools currently on the market. So ChatGPT, Stable Diffusion, MidJourney, et cetera. However, you still have to comply with the remaining requirements of Article 4, including lawful access, possibility of reservation by rights holders. And then there's some general requirements about contractual derogation, the three-step test, and the protection of technological protection measures. Overall, these conditions are more burdensome than those that apply for TDM for scientific purposes, which makes, makes sense. Now, one condition before we go to the opt-out that has not received much attention is related to this lawful access requirement. So from my personal standpoint, there is not enough clarity on whether web scraping or web harvesting activities of Gen AI developers meet this requirement, or even how the Court of Justice in Europe would apply this requirement to commercial providers especially because in other areas of the case law, the court has tended to put additional duties on commercial players as regards material available online, for example, in the hyperlinking case law. Now, much more discussed has been indeed the fact that Article 4 is subject to a reservation by rights holders, including through, now I'm quoting, machine-readable means in the case of content made publicly available online. And this would be include use of metadata in terms of condition and conditions of a website or a service. Now, this possibility of reservation is what's usually called the opt-out, although it might not be the most accurate term. So in my view, the act provisions aiming at additional transparency, documentation, and publicity of information on training materials protected by copyright would be crucial to enable, first, that rights reservation by rights holders can take place, and second, perhaps as important, to check whether such reservation was adequate, adequately carried out by the Gen AI providers or developers in this case. Now, in theory, this made sense, but as you mentioned, there's a sort of discussion that has emerged in whether or not the whole rights reservation or opt-out approach for TDM for commercial purposes is desirable for individual artists and creators. So on the one side, some people say that this has the potential to increase the bargaining power of rights holders, lead to licensing deals from Gen AI providers. And the particular advantage here that I see it as a lawyer would be that the solution is already in the existing copyright law and can be further strengthened by the upcoming AI Act. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel here. And this could enable artists to get paid through a combination of voluntary arrangements, tweaks to collective bargaining, and even collective licensing structures. But other commentators are more critical. Like you mentioned, Trenda Cost and Dr. Rao are among these. What they argue is that this approach will lead to market concentration and exploitation of creators by big companies. And the reason is that creative labor markets are already heavily concentrating and dominant companies, companies have significant bargaining power. So they're going to be able to impose contractual terms on artists that re will require them to sign away their quote unquote training rights for little to no compensation. Now, if we assume that this is going to be the prevalent model on the market, I think the trend of cost and doctoral point should be taken seriously. Because in copyright exploitation world, there has long been a tradition of unequal contractual relationships between individual creators and artists and their commercial exploiters like producers. So I think in particular, it would be crucial that creators are protected against signing away these training rights absent appropriate remuneration. And looking at existent law, it's really not clear whether the rules in the books right now in EU law and even in national laws would be achieving this level of protection for these so-called training rights. So this is really something we should be cautious about. 
So basically making sure the uh, imbalance that exists between creators and big stakeholders is not worsened <laughs> in the AI world. Uh, and and maybe reinforcing it's... existing problems is not what we want here. We want the exactly. solution that brings money to artists. Um, you also mentioned uh, previously filtering and content ID and, and the content moderation aspect uh, of the e, uh, e, uh, sorry of the AI Act, too much EUs and AIs. Um, and, and in the blog post, you refer to the safeguards included in the copyright directives, Article 17, um, which covers the fact that online content sharing service providers, such as the YouTubes and Facebooks uh, of this world, need to include safeguards when removing copyright infringing works and must respect the rights of users to benefit from copyright exceptions, such as quotation, criticism, review, uh, use of the uh, for the purpose of uh, parody or pastiche, but also more generally users' fundamental rights uh, to freedom of speech, for example. Um, looking at all of the debates on Article 17 and the safeguards, and, and where do you see the link with the AI Act? Uh, it's a super interesting question. So this is not a place where there's an explicit reference to copyright, where although it does come in this new batch of rules right next to the copyright specific one. So that's already an indication. So what happens in the AI Act proposal from the parliament is that in addition to the transparency provision, there's an obligation to quote, design and develop the foundation model in a way such as to ensure adequate safeguards against generation of content in breach of union law. And then in line with generally acknowledged state of the art, uh, uh, without prejudice to fundamental rights, including freedom of expression. So this is the sort of language you've seen elsewhere, right? I think the first important point is that this would apply to so-called illegal content. And we know from the DSA discussions that copyright infringing content is illegal content. So this would apply to copyright infringing content at the output side. So the, the problem with a lot of these Gen AI models is that it is possible that certain AI generated output would infringe the rights of creators of works used during the training of the model, right? On the one hand, one-to-one -one copies are possible. This is what's called memorization of content. As far as I can tell from the literature I read and conversations I've had with computer science, one-to-one -one copies in the sense of memorization, they do occur, but they are not statistically significant. They are rarer than not, especially if you do not prompt for it. But it's also possible that the output is highly similar uh, and then what is sufficiently similar under certain laws to be infringing depends on national law. It's not harmonized at you level to pre-existing uh, content that is protected by copyright. So in that sense, what these safeguards would come into play and the way they're written, this is highly reminiscent of the content moderation filtering requirements that you see in Article 17 of the Copyright Directive. And here, it, it's where the, the going a bit into the weeds, it becomes a bit, a bit more complicated. Why? Because all of this discussion on copyright content moderation and filters, we've had it already, or we've been having it with a, a case law from the Court of Justice on exactly uh, what types of systems and what type of permissible filtering should, should be in place so as not to lead to overblocking and in that way preserve the freedom of expression of users. But it's not clear whether any of those considerations really would apply uh, directly here because they apply, as you mentioned, to so-called online content sharing service providers. So OCSSP is in the terrible acronym of the copyright directive. But also these rules that attempt to balance safeguard with freedom of expression and, and obligations to prevent illegal content in the Digital Services Act would not necessarily directly apply here because Gen AI tools uh, are not hosting uh, service providers or online platforms, or if ever comes the case, VLOPs, very large online platforms. So what I think is necessary here is to bolster these safeguards in a way that you actually make the connection so that there is not over, over filtering, over, over blocking. And the problem, I would say, from a freedom of expression perspective is that it's very easy, uh, and you see it already in the copyright discussions, the tendency to propose blunt tools like keyword filtering at the prompt stage, 
or really strong matching filtering at the actual output stage that would prevent things like for, uh, make me an image in the style of X. Well, mostly styles are not protected by copyright and many of similar outputs would be protected as I would call them, let's call them transformative content, but covered by these exceptions that you mentioned that are according to the court of justice based on freedom of expression. So I think we need to think carefully about how to bolster the language that is already in this proposal by the parliament, because there's a real risk here that voluntary solutions put or agreed by rights holders and certain of these providers would lead to an outcome whether or whether where a lot of output is filtered uh, uh, contrary to what would be our desires from the perspective of freedom of expression. So I think that is the real danger here. And although this obligation is well understood and makes reference to freedom of expression, the lack of clear direct application of all the discussions in Aki that we have on the copyright side for filtering in OCSSPs or on the DSA would be valuable here. So that clarification could come, for example, with additional language or in the supporting recitals uh, by better formulation of the provision. And I think it would be welcome here. Um, thank you, Joao. If, if I summarize really um, briefly the very complex uh, elements that you raised, at the input level, uh, we need to make sure that obligations uh, are meaningful and can be complied with, and also that um, creators don't get a worse deal than what they have today <laughs> coming out of it. Um, at the output level, um, I, I would summarize it by saying we don't want artificial intelligence to be controlled by non-intelligent filters <laughs> that uh, basically block uh, the freedom of speech of people and overblock as, as uh, some filters tend to do. Um, thank you so much for your time. And uh, I'm sure we are going to discuss AI for some time uh, in, in, in the next months. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.